Okay, so um, welcome everybody. Sorry that we're not all in the same room again like we were before. Uh, and I hope you're all well. I'm washing your hands, etc. Et now, what we are going to be doing today is I'm going to do a recap of um, just what we went over last week. Uh, this is going to be obviously um, for those of you who aren't actually. I think everyone probably was, you know, listened in and to the, you know, um, the talk. But uh, obviously, this is going to be a continuation of what I did last week. It's quite a different talk to Ramirez. Um, I'm going to recap. We're going to talk about racism as a risk factor for mental disorder. I'm going to talk. About, uh, the point of this talk really is to leave you with a sense that there is something that, that that can be done. Because frankly, this is a bit of an overwhelming issue. I'm going to talk about some of the incentives for change, the policy initiatives that have happened over the years. Tell you a little bit about workforce. Ramiri touched on that actually, and um, and then at the end, I'm going to give you. A, I'm going to tell you about an evidence-based approach to understand the issues, and something that we hope is going to bring about some change. So, just to remind you that uh, basically, when you look at the stats, all mental disorders occur very commonly in people from Black, African, and Caribbean backgrounds. The issue is, of course that as far as anyone's concerned, the only thing that ever really gets talked about is psychosis, in particular schizophrenia. But actually, if you look at this, the really high rates of anxiety and depression and a number of the other, and all the other mental disorders. Etiology, what might be the cause? We don't know the exact cause of mental health problems, but we do know that mental health problems are associated with a number of different factors. So it's, it's multifactorial. Trauma, adverse childhood experiences, negative life events like bereavement, job loss, moving house, financial difficulties, uh, the family environment that you grow up in or that you live in, particularly if it, the people that you're living with are really, really critical of you, really over-involved in your life and give you a very hard time all the time. We know that early and persistent substance use is a problem for some people. And we know that genetics is a problem for some people, which I mentioned last time. What I didn't touch on enough last time, I think, is probably something about perinatal factors. So we know that um, some mental disorders are more likely to happen in people who have had mums who had flu when they were pregnant with them. Uh, we know that impaired fetal development, prenatal malnutrition, and obstetric complications are also associated with mental health problems. So all of these factors are important. For some people, it's some more than others. Again, you'll remember that the issue is that for black people, it's often said, well, this person has, uh, you know, it's often assumed it's, that the, any mental health problem that a black person has will be schizophrenia, and that thing is a genetic problem. But when you look at the works, for example, the work done by Stephanie Hatch, we can see that actually, if you are from a BAME background, particularly if you're a black person, then you are highly likely to have all the problems that go along with having common mental disorders like depression and anxiety and this is this this, this um uh, can see this but uh this um graph basically shows the symptoms i showed you this last week shows all the different symptoms that occur and this is the southeast london cohort and in black bar uh, black bars and then the blue bars are the um adult psychiatric and mobility survey population, that's a general population across Britain, and that's a very high proportion, maximum, a very high proportion of white British people. And you can see there are much higher rates of um, the various uh, different kind of symptoms like fatigue, sleep problems, irritability, worry, depression, etc., in the South London cohort than they are than in the adult psychiatric morbidity survey. You'll remember that what we found, remember. Schizophrenia, when it was checked by the WHO, very big study, seven countries across the world, including um, two predominantly black countries, Nigeria and, and Jamaica. And what was found is that the rates were 1% didn't matter where you were in the world. Okay. And the other thing to remember is that I showed you last week that over time, it looks like the rates in black people are reducing. Yeah. And so the relative risk from 97 to 99 was nearly seven times. Relative risk 2010 to 2012 was um, less than three times. 
that implies that in such a short time, this cannot be a genetic problem. That change cannot be, it, it implies that this is not a genetic issue. There's some, something else going on. Okay. So what did we find? Um, we said that, look, psychosis is probably a heterogeneous condition or number of conditions with similar features with lots of different, um, lots of different factors that could probably combine to, to push an individual into psychosis. It's probably not one thing. For some people, it will be because they come from a family with a heavy genetic loading for schizophrenia. And certainly, I have to say, I have some patients who, black and white, who clearly have what is very obviously schizophrenia, who also have brothers and sisters and mums and dads and uncles and cousins who also have schizophrenia, right? And what's interesting about those families is that they're all the same. It doesn't matter what background they're from, what ethnicity they are. And, this, and the kind of schizophrenia looks really similar to. It's really obvious. Everyone would say this person's got something wrong with them. You might not be able to name it, but you'd know that this was something that was stopping them living their lives. Schizophrenia is a problem term because it's associated with all sorts of negative stereotypes. It's, as I remember, it's only, it's, it's one of a number of different types of psychosis. There are probably a number of different routes to psychosis. And that's really important. It is an issue that black people get given the diagnosis of schizophrenia so often. And I suspect, well not suspect, we know that, we know various reasons for that. Harry talked a lot about that right at the beginning. Social factors. I want to just dwell on this a little bit more because we had to rush through it last week. Immigration, migration is associated with stress. That st the stress of migration, it doesn't matter who you are, Swedish people emigrating to the USA had much higher rates of psychosis in the 1930s. Yeah, it was very well known. This guy Udegaard did this very nice couple of two or three studies and showed that Swedish immigrants to America were much more likely to develop psychosis. There is an in increased incidence of psychosis in people who are refugees, which seems unsurprising. But actually, you might say to yourself, why don't refugees develop loads of PTSD, not psychosis? Okay. Obviously, they do develop PTSD, but they can also develop psychosis. Some people get psychosis, some people get PTSD. It's not always the same people. It looks like there is an increased risk when you are culturally marginalized the distance when the distance between your cultural heritage and that of the majority of society is actually was was found by Dinesh Bukhra's team to distinguish people from black Caribbean backgrounds with first episode um, psychosis from um, black Caribbean controls so there's something about the way in which you yourself feel comfortable in your own skin that's what they were talking about there and that, I think that touched on something that Ramiri spoke about earlier. So, and then I mentioned this as well last week at the end, something about the linguistic distance. Again, that thing of being marginalized and excluded from your, the society within which you're living. Okay. Other social factors, life events. Living in an urban area, early parental separation, parental loss, if there's a lot of parental discord, a lot of discord, you know, a lot, a lot of acrimony when there's that parental separation, that is problematic. Being socially excluded, being unemployed, having um, difficult education um, experiences, living alone, these are all, this is all factors that have been associated with the later development of psychosis. And the ESOT study is a study of first episode psychosis. They looked at um, a, a big population of people, hundreds of people in, again, it's in the South London area, many, but also Manchester, Birmingham, Nottingham. And um, they looked at black people and white people. And this is the kind of thing that they found that actually, if, you, if there was parental loss and these kind of factors, adverse experiences as you're growing up, it was going to be a problem. Ethnic density, what that means is, if you live somewhere where there's a large amount of people who are the same ethnicity and culture as you, then that's an ethnically dense area. However, if you, for example, if I were to move to Cornwall, then there wouldn't be many people like me around. Now, interesting, if I was to move to Cornwall, that would be pretty bad for my mental health because it looks like Jane Boydell found that 
um, there were higher rates of people developing psychosis when they were in areas where there weren't many people like them. So being around people who are a bit more like you seems to be protective, yeah. Question. Does that, does that work in the reverse? So if somebody who is uh, of European descent was to move in an area where they're not the majority, would they start developing mental health problems? The same way That's that. a really good question, actually. Um, you know what's interesting? People haven't really looked necessarily about, say, a white British person going to, um, people haven't really done uh, research. the research in that way. But the ha people have done research looking at other the smaller minority communities in larger majority communities. It looks like it probably holds. Yeah. Um, then, uh, experiences of racism. Mm. So experiences of racism, and it's interesting that, of course, one would expect, given all the controversy about over the years, the last 40 years, about the high rates of uh, um, mental health attention uh, for black people, etc., and the idea that black people are much more likely to have more psychosis, one would have expected, and I think I did say this to you last week, that I said to Greg Morgan, why haven't you looked at this before, that someone would have asked people about their experiences of racism. And it took until... 2002 before someone actually thought to do that it looks like and um there looks like there is an association between the reported racism this is reported racism in the in the um community and uh and racial attacks and psychosis that's one of the first times it's been done yeah and then there's also an association this is something that's coming out now um, there's an, um, look out for this paper. There's an association between psychosis and perceived racism. So this is people saying, mm. you know, I can't. He didn't. He didn't come and hit me. He didn't say the N word. But I could just. I just got a set. I got a sense that there was. It wasn't about. It wasn't about my work. It was just he didn't like me because I was black. And that's a difficult one because, you know, if it's happened to you, you you know it and you can feel it. You know, this, it's a microaggression, but it's really hard to prove it, which makes it all the more difficult. But that has been associated with um, an increased risk of psychosis. So Galton talked about structural violence. And that's really important. I'm going to read it back to you. Social structures and institutions harming the health of individuals a and populations by creating barriers to resources that enable those individuals to meet their fundamental development. Now, oftentimes, this might be done in an ignorant way. You don't realise that. So, for example, you set up your clinic. You set your clinic up from nine to five because guess what? It suits you to work nine to five. However, if you set your clinic up from nine to five, what that means is that if you are someone who is the main child carer in your household, you can't get to that clinic between, um, let's say you have your break at, you know, from 12 till two. You can't, they can't get to the clinic from nine till nine to 12 because it takes an hour to get there on the bus because they have to get the bus and before that they have to drop the kids off at school and in the afternoon by the time they'd get back the school would finish so they can't come to the afternoon session that starts at two because it takes them an hour school finishes at three so what you've done is that you've built the structure of your clinic in such a way that certain individuals can't go there the individual who might not be able to go there are those people who have who have child care um child care responsibilities now, if you think about various cultures, so there are certain cultures where the women are the ones who are most likely to be looking after the kids. So if, I'll give an example. So South Asian cultures, in many cases, it will be the women who are looking after the kids. Those women might not be able to get to your clinic because you have you've set up your clinic in such a way that it's set up for people who work, who don't have kids, because what they do is they think, oh, I've got to go to the clinic. I tell my boss I'm having the day off or the morning off. I go and do that, and then I go to the clinic. No problem. Yeah? Anyway, that's a kind of, uh, it's a kind of minor example. The thing is that what people don't always realise is that social conditions and social experiences are not random. It's not just how it is. People set up structures to suit themselves. And the majority population sets up the structure. The people who are in charge in that majority population set up the structure to suit themselves. So that means 
that most structures are actually set up to suit men. In Britain, obviously, to suit the people who are in charge, who are usually white men. So women are more likely to be marginalised, needs not met. So I'll give an example. A friend said to me, you know what, if men had periods, I tell you now, you wouldn't have period pain anymore. It would have been sorted out by now. But it's all, and then they were talking about, and something else was talking about the menopause. Maybe if men, it's interesting. If you want to, look, if you want this, any of you out there who are going through menopause, anything like that, if you start to look at anything about the menopause, what you'll find is that there's hardly any research on it. If, the, if menopause is something that happens to men, it would have been sorted out by now. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So there's something about what you choose to um, make an issue, what you choose to do, what, what you choose to, to do something about. Where you put your attention and focus, exactly. exactly. Say again? Yeah, of course, because many people, if you're in charge, you know, I'm sure Boris Johnson isn't, isn't there saying, oh, what are, the problem, what are the problems that black people have got? Or he might be now because he's got to, because he's in charge and actually there's a lot of issues with Windrush and everything else. But I'm quite sure that as he was growing up, it never occurred to him. It wasn't really an issue for him because he's not had to experience it. Yeah? The thing is that the fact that you have ongoing poverty and discrimination and threat stem from the fact that these things haven't changed. The question isn't why are they there? The question is, why are they still there? Why have they not changed yet? That's the thing to think about. So this is an example of a, um, structural, a, a structural, uh, um, structural factors in society. So this picture um, shows you the A215, which is Denmark Hill. And it's showing Denmark Hill in London, going from the bottom of the screen is south, going north to, to the top of the screen in town. Now, those of you who recognize these buildings will understand what I'm saying. Yeah, so if you go, if you go to the left, so if you're, if you're going down the road and you turn left, you will get to King's College Hospital. Now, you all know King's College Hospital, because it's on the telly all the time, it's very famous in the UK very famous hospital, 24 hours in A&E, or the rest of it. And you'll know that anybody turning left has got a physical health problem, yes? Yeah? If you go down the road and you turn right, a lot of you may not realize this, but this is the Maudsley Hospital. Maudsley Hospital is also a famous hospital. In fact, the Maudsley Hospital is more famous than King's because it is a world famous mental health hospital. However, what that tells you is this. If someone turns right, they have a mental health problem. If they turn left, they have a physical health problem. We have built these buildings that separate people out. You won't separate out your mind from your body. Yeah? And what's interesting is that if you are someone who's a patient of the Morsey Hospital, you will have horrendous physical health problems. You will die. 20 years earlier because you have much worse physical health problems than everybody else sitting at King's. But it's as though somehow you can separate out your physical self from your mental self, and um, you can't. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly. So I'm just trying to help you understand that this is not, it may not be deliberate, but it is by design. Yeah, and some you know what I mean when I say deliberate. What I'm saying is that people aren't doing it in a Machiavellian way necessarily, mm -hmm. but it, it's it is how it is, and we're so used to it, all of us, that we do not notice it. Mm -hmm. The reason that's important is because sometimes I mean I'll talk about this, but sometimes I say to people, "What do you think will make a difference?" I say to Peter, "Peter, what do you think will make a difference?" He says, "Well, basically, white supremacists have to stop being so racist." And I will say to you, as I said to Tisha. Actually, I don't think people even realise it's happening. In the same way that we didn't realise that there's a hospital over here for mental health and there's a hospital over here for physical health. There are structural things that happen that we just don't notice. For me, every time I go to buy a pair of tights, I get annoyed because I look at it and it says, oh, it says nude. That's not nude for me, that colour. 
or it says, um, what's the other colour? There's the blue or there's tan. None of those colours are for me. They're all, yeah. But again, structural factors, because of the people who developed them in the first place, doesn't mean that they did it deliberately, but the designs are there. So what is the impact of that kind of thinking on our mental health? So bearing in mind the whole thing about structural factors, I want, you to, I want to tell you about this study. I touched on it last week, but I want to tell you about it properly so you really understand what's going on here from that perspective. So this is a study that we did early last year, and it was um, a systematic review Again, of mental health at detentions, that's not the big issue. Surprise, surprise, higher rates of mental health at, de um, mental health at detentions for black people, right? And people from um, African, a black African Caribbean, but also South Asian and East. Basically, if you were an ethnic minority in a majority white country or you're a migrant, there was a higher risk of you being detained involuntarily. So that's detained under section, okay? What was more interesting is the reasons, the explanations that were given by the researchers to explain their findings of higher rates of detention in black people. Okay, that's really important. And um, what we did was to look at those explanations and to see whether those explanations actually were explained by the evidential findings in the paper. Okay, and what did we find? We found that in nearly 50% of cases, the explanations were based on no evidence or unsupported by the evidence that was in the paper. So the researchers had actually just made assumptions about what they thought was going on. Now, the reason that's particularly important is because what happens with research is you do your research, you make a finding, Someone else looks at your finding and says, ha ha, look at this. Smith et al. found that, um, you know, black men were more likely to be detained and they found they're more likely to be detained because, oh, what's one of the no supporting primary evidence here? Because they were more likely to use drugs. Now that, in fact, was an assumption made by the researchers, not based on the evidence that they found. The second researcher, says, as we know, as found by Smith et al, black men are more likely to use drugs and this is why they are more likely to be detained. Then that becomes something that is said again and again and cited again and again by the next researcher and it becomes a truth. Well, it's a, well, that's the question. This is the question. It becomes the truth. It's what you can say, it's, it's a, an assumption based on their cultural stereotypes, yeah, based on the race of that individual, okay? And what we found is that we, so that table that's up there right now shows the uh, explanations, we, we grouped them into, um, this is actually using somebody else, this is Swaran Singh, um, using Swaran Singh's uh, uh, categorization. Um, we've got patient-related explanations, illness-related explanations, service-related explanations, cultural-related explanations, and something about the, uh, the uh, service interface. And um, you can see that for a, a proportion of these explanations, there was no supporting evidence. That included drug misuse, language barriers, socioeconomic status, illness expressed as violence or challenge, which is really important, uh, poorer detection or diagnosis in the service, that wasn't one either, greater stigma in, in the black population, that wasn't one either. There's some that there were there was a support a support of sorry a mixture of supportive and contradictory evidence, and then the ones the, the explanations that actually were supported by the evidence were uh, people not adhering to their treatment so well. That's that's the same for everybody. People who don't adhere to the treatment are more likely to get ill if they actually need that treatment. Um, it looked like there were uh, aspects of residential instability, instability surprise, racial bias in the patient treatment interesting um, where the service was that's a that's a structural factor and uh, look at that ex ethnic dis uh, density and then alienation from services and mistrust and that probably links with BME perceptions of mental illness and services 
So these are the factors that have some explanations. These have mixed explanation, mixed mixture of a bit of explanation, but contradictory explanation. And these just didn't have any explanation at all. That's interesting and very important because how many times people said, well, they got, they got detained because they were violent. Anyway, so this is just a summary of that. Uh, we concluded that untested explanations tended to deal with cultural and demographic bound assumptions of minority groups, for example, drug use and race community stigma around mental illness, which weren't true. The problem is that those hypotheses are of limited use, particularly if you apply them to non-specific ethnic groups. The other thing that we found is that everyone was lumped together. So um, uh, I'll give you an example, South Asian people. If you are, if you are a, an, in 1980s, um, one in 20 Indian men was a doctor because do doctors were literally asked to come from India in the 70s. It's in the 70s, right? So what surprise? One, however, compare that to people who came from Bangladesh around that time. And people who came from Bangladesh around that time were actually often having to come to escape um, really awful floods and devastation. So they were coming as refugees. That's very different groups of people. Bangladeshi people were much more likely to be um, in, in impoverished circumstances, whereas Indian people were more likely to be in actually fairly well-off circumstances. That means that, and we've, we've, I've said to you already, you remember from last week, that actually all the social disadvantage that is linked to being poor and not having somewhere to live and all the rest of it increases the risk of you having mental health problems. How can you then lump those people together with other people who have a complete, basically a completely different socioeconomic status? And we know that those people are far less likely to have mental health problems. Yeah? So lumping everyone together because everyone's black does not make sense because people have very different um, experiences and different outcomes. And also what it means is that it doesn't lend itself towards you treating somebody as an individual. Everybody else, everybody has their own individual culture and their individual background that you only know about from thinking about it, asking them what their what their culture is. Yeah. Oh yeah. So we have one question. Um, I work in the CMHS service. Yeah, so it's a community mental health service, yeah. With a borough that has 46% African Caribbean population. Yes. A low proportion of BME young people are not engaging with the services compared to white British counterparts. However, a high number of BME young adults are being admitted to inpatient units and being sectioned under the Mental Health Act. Mm -hmm. How can we get the BME population to engage with services when they are not in a crisis? Okay, keep listening. <laughs> that's, that's what's going to be at the end. Very good question. So the other one is interesting because all of the explanations given are quite blaming and absorb the role of systematic inequalities in so I think it's a, it's a comment to what you were talking about. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for spotting that. Good. That's absolutely right. That's the problem. The idea is that it, the issues lie within the individual, when actually, I hope what I've demonstrated to you is that there is much more going on and wider societal factors are really important. So, um, just to say that untested hypotheses are of limited use. That's what Ramu was saying right at the end. Okay. And if you make assumptions about combined groups and you fail to take into account all the intersectionality, then it means that you make your assumption and you don't ask any more questions. I keep going back to that idea of why, it's one thing to find it, why hasn't anything been done? And it's, nothing's been done because actually what happened is people said, oh, black people have more psychosis, full stop. It's genetic, full stop then you don't need to keep looking. Although I would say, well, if it's genetic, then do something about the genes, if you really think that. But I don't think that people have even got that far. Nigel, it's not about the genes. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's not about the genes. Anyway, all right. One person asked, so it seems like your point is to rather than create a service for black people, you need to redesign and health services to be more appreciative of individual differences, which includes taking into account their ethnic background. I feel like dancing because I feel like you're starting to get it. In order to understand what to do, you have to understand the evidence, and that's what I'm trying to give you. 
and you're already working out for yourself. When you hear what I've got to say at the end, you'll realise that what comes from this comes the evidence. And you need to actually, let me carry on, let me carry on. So what we found very quickly, just say, is that there is a real lack of clinic, proper clinical and demographic data. There are inappropriate ethnic equivalences. You know, um, actually, as much as my experience growing up in Britain will be the same as another black person growing up in Britain, it's also very different. And the only way you will know that is by asking me. Do not make assumptions about me, okay? Because you don't know about me. In the same way that I wouldn't make assumptions. I mean, okay, we all make assumptions about people a little bit, but you, the, problem, the problem basically is if you are, I would say, if you're a black man, you, there are, you can be five ways. But if you're a white man, you can be any which way you like, yeah? So a black man, you are, you are a, an athlete, you're, a, a, you're an entertainer, you are a drug dealer or a drug taker, okay, for anything else? Okay, well, maybe it's only four then. Maybe, but you know, I tell you, I can tell you right now that people say to me, oh, what's it you do? Less so now, but what is it you do? I say, oh, I'm a doctor. You're a dancer. No, no, I'm a doctor. Oh, so where do you dance? <laughs> I'm a doctor. You're a doctor. When you say you're a doctor, when you say you're a doctor, what type of doctor do you mean? Well, and I say, oh, um, well, actually, I'm a psychiatrist. Actually, even before I was a psychiatrist, I was a psychiatrist. Oh, so you're not a proper doctor then. <laughs> anyway, so, but actually, that's, that's everyone says that's black people say that as well. It's not anything else, but anyway. But, uh, is it a risk factor for mental disorder racism? Well, I would say it was. Just remember the risk factors, sex, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, age, reason, poverty, etc. And then Stephanie Hatch again. And they looked at discrimination. And they looked at the prevalence of discrimination across multiple life domains. And <laughs> they wanted to describe associations between discrimination and this is common mental disorder. What do they find? You know, lots of people said they're from an ethnic minority in this group. High rates of, as we, say, as we said, high rates of common mental disorder. And for those people who experience um, common mental disorder, there was major everyday and anticipated discrimination every day. And that was associated with an almost, well, two to four fold increased risk of common mental disorder. So if you experience discrimination, you are more likely to, to develop some kind of mental health problem. If you say, if you said to someone, for example, we know that, I showed you this, the, uh, the evidence, gay people are much more likely to experience discrimination about their sexuality, and surprise, surprise, it's associated with developing mental health problems. I don't know why people wouldn't think that discrimination, which is a type of abuse, it's a trauma. It might be a if you it might be a low level trauma. It might not be that you get beaten up and racially attacked every day. But if you have microaggressions every single day, or maybe it's not every day. Maybe it's once a week or twice a week, or maybe it's once a month. If you feel discriminated against because you are, then it's going to have an impact on your self esteem, and that will have an impact on your mental health. Why wouldn't it? So I teach, um, you know, uh, psychiatric trainees, and I and I face them the same thing about discrimination. Everyone, everybody accepts that trauma is associated with the later development of mental health problems. And I say, okay, and we go through the types of trauma that that might include, and the three main types are uh, um, physical abuse, being hit, uh, sexual abuse, and emotional abuse. And there's a recognition that emotional abuse Funny enough, it's probably one of the worst ones because if you are sexually abused, you are emotionally abused as well. If you're physically abused, you're emotionally abused as well. So it always happens. We talk about the different types of emotional abuse that there are and people come up with all sorts of different things. What, I said, Hannah, what about racism? And we talk, I said, oh yeah, well that would. How many times do you ask your patients about their experiences of racism and discrimination? 
So in this study, they were particularly looking at um, racial discrimination. Okay. So um, the point is that actually, if, and if you feel that you and it's and people talk about perceived racism because you can't. It's such a it's a subjective thing because it's really hard to be objective about it because objective over racism everyone can see. Yeah, and so and there's an underestimation of the impact of that subjective racism, that perceived racism. And what people also need to understand is that that racism is actually available on a societal level as well because of some of the images that are seen. And I, in fact, I really wish I'd put it in here, actually. I've got, do, do, I wonder if people remember the cartoon that was done of Serena Williams against um, Naomi um, uh, Atsuka, the tennis players. So if you, you know, all of you sitting at home, have a quick look at that. It was caused lots of controversy last year because um, if you remember, Serena Williams had lost the match against Naomi, who now bearing in mind, Serena Williams is a black woman, and guess what? Naomi's a black woman too. She's she's mixed race, she's um, half, Japanese. half Japanese and, and half African American. I want you to have a look at the um, if you can please have a look at the cartoon. In that cartoon. Serena Williams is shown as a big, butch, angry, she almost like a gorilla, brutish, she looks brutish. Now, more importantly, look and see how Naomi is, um, is depicted. This is a woman who is a mixed race woman. Nigel, can you tell me, just describe what you see. Thick thin, blonde hair, dainty, thin, looking, Terribly described her. Submissive, inoffensive. Now, the thing is, it's interesting because I thought, there's Serena, black woman who got stroppy, depicted as animalistic and angry. And there's Naomi, who's also a black woman, depicted as a thin, white, blonde woman. Now, the person who drew the cartoon defended, he said, I, I'm not racist. He doesn't know that that is a racist, a racist depiction. But that is something, back to perceived racism, he doesn't know, and there are lots of people who defended him actually, because that's not, it's just, it's just, you know, they don't understand what it is. This is an image, when I, I, I was very offended by this image. I was actually more offended by the way in which Naomi was depicted as a blonde woman. The implication, back to the Dull experiment, the implication being that if you're the good, the good one, you've got to be blonde and thin and white. Okay. Yes, it is. But the, the, the cartoon is about sure. But what I'm talking about is the impact on the individual who is subjected to that. The, yeah, yeah, the, the yeah, the, the perceived racism, and that's I'm just explaining that because it, it's you, you, it's very hard to you know describe it objectively okay anyway uh we've talked about that already so just to remind you race like oh, it's going on for too long i've got to tell you the answer uh you've seen this before basically racism is associated with mental ill health it's overt racism isn't the problem that's the most important thing it's not overt racism it's a problem it's actually the perceived racism and the structural and the institutional factors that are impacting on people. Okay, now the reason that's important is because actually, if what you're thinking is the way to make a difference is to stop individuals from being racist, it's not going to happen. Otherwise, it would have stopped by now because individuals are a lot less racist than they used to be. So, why do we need to change this? Well, because it's not fair, it's morally wrong, it's ethically wrong, it's illegal. I was going to read out the Equality Act, I'm not going to look it up, it is illegal, okay? And very importantly, for those of you who don't, aren't that fussed about the morals, not that fussed about the ethics, and to be honest with you, look, we know it's illegal but it still happens, what can you do? Think about the cost, it's really expensive. 90% of people 
who were detained under the Mental Health Act of, of Black, African or Caribbean In medium security and low security, 12 and 18% are Black. So basically, this is, so just to explain, you've got your mental health services, you've got your general health, mental health services, you've got general mental health inpatients, and then you've got psychiatric intensive care, the locked ward, and then as you go, as you go up through the service, and when I say up, I mean in levels of security, you have low secure, medium secure, then high secure, high secure, you will have heard of places like Broadmoor, Rampton, Asper. Okay? If you, it, just like prisons, there's a much higher proportion of black people in the secure establishment. The thing is, if you are, if you are not, at, the cost of your treatment in mental health service is about £2,000 in the community per year. If you get admitted to hospital, if you come in voluntarily, there's an average of about 40 days admission, it's about £12,000. If you come in involuntarily, same, uh, you know, you'll stay in for longer, I'm afraid. You'll be in for about, uh, actually, probably about six weeks on average. That's £18,000. Actually, voluntary admission is slightly shorter than a, it's a bit shorter than that, um, the 40 days. But the involuntary admission is, is six weeks, that's 40 days. And the in, and the so the involuntary admission about forty days, in uh, the voluntary admission when you come in of your own free will is probably about 25, 25, 30 days. If you are admitted to a secure setting, and bearing in mind this is a conservative estimate, we haven't included the cost of uh, the lack of the lack of um, uh, you know working and tax intake and everything else. But the cost of being admitted to a secure service is about £320,000. Because the average length of admission is about 18 months. So, if you care about nothing less, care about the amount of money it costs your pocket. Because if you are a taxpayer, it is costing you. If you're not a taxpayer, the taxes pay for the lights in the street. The taxes pay for the schools and the health service and everything else. So there is a really important reason to do something about this. And as I say, remember, people who are getting these problems are young people. If you are 22 years of age and you are taken away from um, your job, you're not contributing. You are costing. Yes. So if you care nothing about people's clinical state, their moral state, you don't care nothing about their relationships and their family, and all you care about is then care about the money. So, there have been lots and lots and lots of different policy initiatives over the year, years, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but people have tried things like black only wards, black staff. For me, we tried opening a black hospital at one point. Things haven't really worked because people have thought, what about this project? This will help, this will help. I think the reason that, had, that these things haven't worked is because actually what we haven't attended to is the structural change. So, very quickly about workforce. Um, six minutes. Right, very quickly about workforce then. I'm just going to quickly scoot through this. Right, people always say, if only we had more black doctors, it will be okay. If we only had more black nurses, it will be okay. It will make all the difference. Okay, so just so you can have a quick look at this, this is psychiatrists. Actually, psychiatry is the most um, ethnically diverse um, of the mental health workforce. There are actually quite a lot of black doctors, and there are a lot of Asian doctors, etc. More Asian doctors than anything else, actually. Just to say, although the black doctor, the black black doctors mirror the number of um, black people in the population, but in fact, slightly more, about four percent. <laughs> Percent of black people in the population is about three percent. However, bear in mind that the percent of black people in mental health services is about nine percent. So black doctors are actually underrepresented. The other thing to tell you is that the black doctors tend to be from African origin, and a lot of them are first generation. Now, there is an argument to say that black black people of first generation African origin are not necessarily that similar or understand the culture of someone who's born and brought up in Peckham from a Caribbean background. And that's that thing about trying to lump people together. So I was, I was a bit wary when people say, if we just had more black staff, it'd be okay. Because actually cultural misunderstandings can still happen. Oh, this hasn't come out very well at all. It seems to have disappeared, so about that. 
that's a little bit unfortunate. But just to say, have a look at it yourself if you get the chance. But basically, nursing, nursing is the next most diverse uh, of the workforce, about 30% of mental health nurses identify as BAME. And um, sorry, is this causing problem for you, the meeting? No, it's not good. Okay, good. Um, and uh, the good news is that um, there are lots of black nurses. The not so good news is that they tend to be in rather junior levels and not very much at senior levels. Social work, social work is pretty good, still not as um, uh, culturally and ethnically diverse as um, psychiatry or nursing, but not doing, not doing too badly. And there is an increase in BME people enrolling onto social work courses, and that's a very positive thing. Now, this is where the problem comes. So, the people who deliver most of the therapy in mental health care are the psychologists and the occupational therapists. Occupational therapy is improving, but essentially it's a predominantly white British um, uh, profession. Uh, there are about 10% of people from a BME background. And that, but the good news is that a few years ago, when I looked at it, there were about 16% of occupational therapy students from a BME background. The hope is that they continue through and they actually become occupational therapists. So we might start to see more now. Unfortunately, this hasn't come out very well, but particularly important is clinical psychology. Unfortunately, clinical psychology is a white profession. In fact, it's a white female profession, really. Um, and uh, only 1.7% of clinical psychologists are identified as black. That's, a, that's just too small a number of people. The other thing is there are loads of structural barriers. Back to structural factors. i put it in big capital letters there. Back to structural factors, if you can see it. Thing is, if you want to become a, cl a clinical psychologist, essentially you've got to fund yourself for about two or three years. You have to be able to now afford your course, you know, the um, undergraduate course, then the postgraduate course. Then there is an expectation that you will go and get clinical experience. To get clinical experience, you have to volunteer for free, unpaid volunteer. And it will be two years of doing that. Also, you have to know somebody who works in the profession to get, a, you know, maybe to get a volunteer job. Or you're right round to how many people, 100 different people. They've not got time because there's 100 other people all writing. Frankly, if you aren't in the profession, if your family aren't in the profession, if your family aren't professionals, it's not likely you're going to know a psychologist. This the literally, the hot, becoming a psychologist is a structurally discriminatory um, process. Full stop. Yeah. Back to structural facts. I know I keep going on about them, but I really want you to understand that. Same for managers. This is. I just want to say this picture. This is my ward night out. Right. This is last year in the summer. Unfortunately, we'll be able to do that this year. I think. But anyway. Um, now you'll see that actually there's a lot of black staff. So those people say, what about black staff? There are plenty of black staff. Listen, however, it's not enough. It's not enough. It really isn't. And it's not, and people say, yeah, but the black staff are already racist. We're just as bad. We're all, we don't realize that we're being, our heads are just full of the white man's thinking. It's not as simple as that. There are some people maybe who think that, but actually remember all these people, the women ladies, they've all got their they've all got kids. They all sit there and think, this person could be my child in a way that my white colleagues don't necessarily do. So I spend a lot of my time saying, are we doing the right thing by this person? Does this person really need to be here? Yeah. And what I've done is realize that you can do stuff for individuals, but really you need to make a structural change. So what can we do? Personally, you could say, stop the racism. Stop the racism being used that against me. So what people do is that Mamiri described this very nicely. What do you do to make it so that you're less racist? You appear less black, yes? Okay, maybe you dress differently, maybe you speak differently, maybe you do your hair differently, things like that, right? It doesn't really make that much of a difference. Just, you know, institutionally, you might say, the institution just needs to be stopped being racist, like the police and mental health services, just need to stop being racist. And that, that'll make a difference. That argument raised for years. It's just not enough. Structurally, you could say, 
what we need to do is to just stop being raceless. That's what's been said. Again, that argument raised for years. Actually, what you can do on a personal level is there's something about that we have to accept it. Racism is there. You have to be able to build up resilience. I would say that we need to be teaching our children, this is what I do with my kids, but actually how to withstand this. And you do it with evidence. Yes? And the evidence is the evidence of yourself as a person. And maybe we talked about that. The evidence of what's around you. So you have to educate yourself and understand it so that you can use that evidence. They actually, you, I think you'll find, I mean, Malcolm described it really nice last week, talking about IQ tests, how culturally bound IQ tests are without people even realizing them. Okay. In the institution, and this goes to the question before, you have to build your institution in such a way that it doesn't matter if the unconscious bias exists because it's irrelevant if someone is unconsciously biased because you built your institution and the structure in such a way that it doesn't matter. Yes? So you have to, so for example, one of the things that um, Behavioural Nudge Unit has suggested now is when people go for it, you go for an interview. If I go for an interview, classic medical consultant interview, you've got a panel of 10 people, right? And, you know, those 10 people are generally, certainly when I was, you know, younger, or would be, you know, middle-aged men. And they look at me and they, I mean, that's their job. They're judging me to see if I'm good enough to do this job. The way they judge me is going to be dependent on what they think about black women. Yes? Are black women competent or not? Are black women hardworking or not? Are black women conscientious? Can this person do it? Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? The issue, of course, is that for black people, unfortunately, the stereotypes that are um, put, put onto us are often quite negative. Hence why, even though black people are educated, often to a very high level, sorry, time, 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 put it stop. Oh, okay, okay, right, just move on, uh, what's I saying? Um, the, you can, so what they've done, instead of having a panel of 10, instead what happens is that you have to have an interview with people, five, six, seven groups of, you know, or five groups of two people. They all rate you. The idea being that there'll be some of those people who aren't racist, and then they score you, and they don't know the scores. And interestingly, they've done that particularly looking at pre women, and they're finding that the women are doing much better than they do in the traditional type of interview. Okay? That's changing the institutional structures, changing the, um, and then you have to build structures which meet the needs of everyone, regardless of their ethnicity and culture. So that's the idea of your clinic. You don't have a nine to five clinic, you have a seven to ten clinic, maybe, or seven to eight clinic. Yes? Okay. If it's work, they can come after work. If it's after childcare or pre child etc. Yeah. So we have developed an evidence-based approach to understanding the issues. We know that structural factors engender racism and stigma and stereotyping, and that increases the risk of differential experience. We know that there's a lack of cultural awareness in staff, and there's need more need for culturally appropriate care. We know that research links inequalities to racism as well as other negative socioeconomic factors, and as you know, David Williams said, the multiple aspects of racism combine and relate with each other additively and interactively, and that affects health, in particular mental health. What people should do is look at the Mental Health Act review reporting documents. The answer is in there. We have made these recommendations. Those recommendations essentially address the structural and institutional issues. We talk about organizational competence frameworks that people can, an organizational competence framework called the patient and care race equality, um, uh, race equality framework, and a tool to make sure that's been done. And what it involves is institutions learning how to meet the needs of their population by going out and meeting their population and finding out what their population needs. Ask the population what they need, what would make you want to come and see us when you are feeling not so good before you are brought in by the police. Now, at that point, people will get, after a while, you know, you invite people in, people get to know you a little bit better, maybe think maybe not so scary. I'd rather, you might say, what I want to do is talk to somebody who is a bit like me, and then they discover that the person who's most like them isn't necessarily the African, middle-aged African nurse over here, it might actually be this um, younger doctor over there, yeah? Okay. So you find out what people want and you change your service so it better meets their needs. Now what will happen is after a year or two, some people in the community will think, all oh, right, I'm going to go a bit earlier. 
those could be, might only be, so in our service, for example, we have 90 beds. It might only be 10 of those people come earlier, but those 10 people who come earlier will not be costing you over three million pounds because even if they do end up in hospital, they're more likely to end up coming in, um, not into the secure services because they won't be brought in by the police, they'll be brought in with the GP. Yes? Okay. And then cultural advocacy, very important. This is this, do have a read of this, it tells you what you should do. This is your organizational competence framework. Cultural advocacy, really importantly, and this is a really key one, tailored early interventions for children. Yeah? Because we know, as I said last week, that if a child gets, if a child is falling off the, um, the, the ladder, the, the escalator of school, then we know there's a problem. The tailored early inter interventions just uh, zero excluded. And then, of course, greater representation in the therapies of black people. Okay. I'm not going to go through all of those because you can read it yourself at your leisure. All right. The good news is this this is important. The government have actually accepted our recommendations and they are, um, well, until recently, they were actually starting to implement them. So this, this now being piloted and it's not about particular things here and there, it's about saying, how will you change your institutions to suit the needs of your local population? Okay. And that's it. Thank you. Dr. Lardy, you have a couple of